Hello and let's talk about the COVID-19 situation in India. The number of cases in India has crossed 6 lakh as it looks like India is soon set to be the country with the third highest number of cases reported overtaking Russia. Meanwhile, we are in this nebulous zone called Unlock 2.0 even as both the central and state governments have no clear answers as to the rising number of cases. Prime Minister Modi in his speech a few days ago stayed away from any concrete details on the government strategy. And Maharashtra Chief Minister Uddhav Thakre on Wednesday did a puja and went on to say and I quote, We want to see a miracle. Human beings are given up. We'll discuss some of these issues but first here are some numbers. As of today morning, nearly 6.04 lakh cases have been reported across India. India currently has the fourth highest number of cases behind United States, Brazil and Russia. The number of active cases is around 2.26 lakh. Between 10.30 am yesterday and today, 19,148 cases were reported. During the same time period, 2.29 lakh tests were conducted. The number of deaths in India is 17,834. We are 8th on the list of countries with the highest death toll and in the past 24 hours, 434 deaths were reported. Maharashtra continues to be the worst affected state in the country with over 5,500 new cases reported yesterday and 198 deaths. The Thane Municipal Corporation, the Kalyan Dobiwali Municipal Corporation and the Meera Bhayandar Municipal Corporation have all gone into total lockdown mode for 10 days from today. These three are part of the Mumbai metropolitan region. The corporations of Navi Mumbai and Panvel will follow suit tonight. Tamil Nadu and Delhi are the second and worst, third worst affected states. The city of Chennai and parts of neighbouring districts continue to be in lockdown as well. We have with us Prabir Purkayasa to talk about some of these issues. Thank you, Prabir, so much for joining us. So, India continues to report a high number of new daily cases. We're almost close to the 20,000 cases a day mark. And uh, right now, it doesn't look like the government has too many answers. Like we just mentioned, Prime Minister Modi has uh, almost didn't talk any details in his speech. Neither are many of the chief ministers. So, how do you see the uh, rise in the number of cases happening, especially over the next couple of weeks? Well, if we look at the figures right now, and I'm looking at the worldometer figures, which gives you the total uh, figures from different parts of the world, country-wise also, you will see India is not only high in terms of the number of cases, it is the fourth highest, but in a couple of days, maybe two to three days, it's going to overtake Russia as the third highest number of total cases. But if you look at the new cases, that's where you will see the speed at which we are moving. And that's quite disquieting. Because but the US, of course, always holds the number one position with regard to total number of cases, which is nearing now 3 million. Brazil is one and a half million. We are at the moment about 600,000 plus. But in terms of new cases, US is 51,000. Brazil is 44,000, about 45,000. We are nearly 20,000, as you have said. And other countries are well below that. Below that is South Africa, Russia, Mexico, and so on. What we are seeing is essentially a now two global centers of pandemic, new epicenters, shall we say, apart from the United States, which continues to be the epicenter, which is Latin America. It has Brazil, it has Mexico, it has Colombia, it has a number of other countries, but these are the three major ones. And then we have South Asia, India and Pakistan. Pakistan is about 200,000, given its size of its population. I think that's also quite disquieting. So we are seeing a new epicenters emerging now with the COVID epidemic. And that shows that we are in, by no means in the home stretch globally. As WHO has warned, the numbers are going up. And of course, in India as well. If you look at the Indian figures first, I'm look, looking at compared to the global figures. These are the charts we have. And as you can see, Malaysia, which was lower than us initially in the first uh, couple of weeks, is now flattened. Most other countries which are in the grip of epidemic earlier, like Iran, Italy, France, UK, all seem to have flat curves. Of course, some of them, as we know, are seeing some recurrences again. But most of the European Union countries and even Iran and UK, which were relatively badly affected earlier, seem to have flattened. The only exception here, which you can see on this chart, is really Brazil and then India, who are going up very steadily over the last 30, 40, 50 days. The slope in India has not changed of the graph over the last 50, 60 days. And that's true for Brazil. Brazil, we can understand, because after all, Brazil did not 
have any lockdown. India, these figures are disturbing because we have had a very draconian lockdown, one of the most draconian in the world, and yet our figures do not show any changes. And it does appear that the central government now has almost given up. It is offering nothing to the states, and it's only thing that it has come out in the Modi's speech was about food grains, but it really does not have anything else with respect to the epidemic. So I think that's a very disquieting scene that we see over there. The other part which I would like to focus on in terms of the epidemic itself, that what are we are seeing now, and uh, this is again a disturbing issue, that we are seeing about six cities having the bulk of the COVID infections. In this, Mumbai, Delhi and Chennai almost cover 40% of India's total infections, but that's not the full picture. If you add, for instance, to Delhi, Gurgaon, Faridabad, Noida, and a couple of other urban areas, as Mumbai, you add, for instance, the Navi Mumbai, you add Kalyan and other things, but most important news, you add Thane, which has about 33,000 cases, you will get the picture is that these six cities, including cities like Ahmedabad, which have also fairly high figures, you will see six cities nearly have 50 to 60 percent of the total COVID uh, in, infected persons. And this is because it's really spreading in urban areas, in densely populated areas, where this question of physical distancing, etc., et doesn't arise. And they also contain a very large number of what we are being called essential workers who effectively run the city and also work on healthcare facilities in a lot of the hospitals. So the centers of infection now are becoming those which are densely populated where people have to go out, do go out and work in places where they are open to infections. And you can see if we don't control those numbers, you are going to see a continuous rise of the numbers. And as of date, there are steps that Maharashtra has taken vis-a-vis -vis Mumbai, particularly Mumbai, they have seemed to have done some amount of control, but it has exploded now in the suburbs or the urban continuum, which is the Mumbai uh, urban sprawl, so to say. And that's similar things we are, it's also happening in Delhi. We now know about Gurgaon and Faridabad, but the figures from Noida, etc., seem to be underestimates maybe because the testing figures themselves are pretty low in those places. But in terms of lockdowns and other uh, containment zones, Noida is not very far behind either. Right. So and the key question here also is that uh, we have discussed this, of course, that there was no real preparation done during the lockdown to strengthen the public health infrastructure. There was no real attempt made to give it a community, uh, so give it a, to give, add a community element to combating the disease itself. So right now, as we uh, as we are seeing a drastic impact, can some of these steps be implemented, or the, do governments have no other option but just sort of sit back and hope for the best? Like Uddhav Thakare said that we are hoping for a miracle. Well, miracles aside, I told you we can hope, continue to hope for miracles, but unless we do something, miracles won't occur. So what are the things we can do? First is reduce the death rate. One of the important lessons we have learned is that hospitals can handle this disease much better because we have a much better understanding of the disease today. The two major reasons for deaths that are taking place, the primary one, and once you are very serious, that this becomes a primary really issue, is the inflammation of the lung. It's no longer COVID-19, the disease itself. It's not the virus itself that's a problem. But the fact your body reacts against it, and by reacting, it actually overreacts, leading to essentially damaging the lung in very diff different ways. And that means the pa patient then needs to pro be provided oxygen and other support. Now, while doing it, earlier ventilators were used and people were intubated. Now they're finding oxygen support and controlling the infection by using corticosteroids. Dexamethasone is a, obviously the primary one at the moment. The dexamethasone brings down the inflammation. It has to be controlled dosage because if it's given in a fairly uh, reasonable dose, not too high, not too low, then it sort of has the benefit of reducing the inflammation, but does not really lead to bodies, uh, antibodies or your immune system becoming lowered 
so that you don't fight the disease itself, which is the, of course, the virus. So both have to be sort of, the, you have to hit the, sweet, hit the sweet spot, so to say, by which you don't give too high a dose and not too low a do dose either, which seems to have now been reached with the various information we have. The second, of course, is the other one, which has also been mentioned in the serious cases. You get a certain number of cases, but blood clotting is a serious issue. And therefore, medicines which lower or which are essentially blood thinners, that seems to have helped. So that worldwide seems to have brought down the, the death figures compared to the number of hospitalization. We have to see that this happens in Indian hospitals as well. So this, the question of intubation, being not done quickly probably would also help because that itself has, of course, an adverse reaction on the patient. Then you may not need to intubate if you can provide oxygen supply initially and then control the inflammation. This is what we seem to read in the various technical papers that we are now uh, going through. And the second part of it also is that you must have enough beds. Beds, you must strengthen the hospital system. Now, that is something which we should have done in all this period, which we didn't do. Now we have we are opening COVID hospitals, for example, in Delhi, new hospitals. But do they have the ability, the preparation to be able to handle this disease is a key question. We can take, of course, create new facilities which are for essentially quarantining not so serious patients. But the next issue really, apart from quarantine, treat, track, all those things which are being said, the question is to treat the serious patient so you bring down the death figures. And that is something entirely doable at the moment. Of course, we can only reduce them. We cannot bring it down to zero. And then secondly, protecting the hospital staff and hospitals itself not becoming a center of infection. Unfortunately, some of the steps we see, apart from whether the protective gear, etc., are available or not, is also the fact that you then need to tell the doctors, tell the nurses, tell the health support staff what they have to do so that it is limited in the hospital. And most important, the hospital administration has to see how the COVID and non-COVID parts of the hospital can be separated. Otherwise, one part of it will infect the other. The hospital will, will become, as it has become, in fact, in large parts of the world, including India, as new centers of the epidemic. And that would be disastrous. When treating the epidemic, you are actually creating more problems and more infections. So I think these are two things the government should have done. And this needed coordinated work with the government of India and the, the state governments. The last part which you have raised, should we give up the spread of the epidemic? No. I think you still have to trace, track, quarantine. These are three measures we still have to take. And we have to also involve, as you said, not only the administrative apparatus, but also involve the people. It cannot be done without the large scale support of the people. Now, the only support that people have been asked to express is Thali Bajana, bang your pots and vessels, and then switch off your lights for 10 minutes. That is not an involvement of the people. Involvement of the people has to be at the grassroots level, which is where Kerala really scores. They have involved the panchayats. They have involved the state administration. They have involved a whole number of voluntary systems which exist in Kerala, which work all the time. And they have supported the government by doing other you know, support activities. So it's a whole range of support that needs to be provided instead of teaching it, treating it as a law and order problem. You can even see, I was looking at the pictures in the morning on television, police brandishing their lattes. And we had a, a very strange case in Telangana, where in Hyderabad, uh, affidavit has been filed in court, which says to the Police constables or officers were checking coronavirus presence in the people with the lattes. Now, if that is your understanding of the health system, that you can check coronavirus infection using lattes, we are indeed in trouble. And I think it's that approach that, that also marks the way we are not able to involve the people. Because, you know, brandishing lattes does not really get, shall we say, it may get compliance, but it doesn't really get cooperation and involvement. And I think that's the key issue where we are lacking because it's a mystery. Brazil did not do a lockdown. They have a rate of curve, which is quite high. United States, as you know, had lockdowns sporadically, did it late, didn't have testing properly. And now is the process of lifting lockdowns again. And you can see the lockdowns correlate fairly well to the infections. 
they have opened the lifted the lockdowns infections have started going up rapidly india you see irrespective of what we do a very steady growth which means our lockdown was ineffective and the steps we are taking are also proving to be equally ineffective so i think this is where we need to analyze and then take corrective action i think giving up is not an option because this will destroy the economy it is not going to restore the economy but if if the infections are there people are not going to throng to the shops buying stuff people are not be, will be able to turn up for work so the it, it, economic downturn will continue we are looking at a 5 to 7% drop of gdp which is probably very conservative so i think that the precondition for winning the battle against on the economic front do it really hinges on willing the battle against covid-19 therefore i don't think this giving up or waiting for a miracle is an option at all absolutely thank you so much prabhu for talking to us that's all we have in this episode of let's talk we'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country until then keep watching news click